Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We are beginning a new study in 2 Corinthians. We're still doing parables on Wednesday. What we saw in uh, 1 Corinthians, the, the uh, Apostle Paul, he heard some disturbing reports about the Corinthian church. They were full of pride. Uh, they were exercising uh, a different... Uh, characteristics that we wouldn't probably typically like to talk about even sexual immorality the spiritual gifts were being used uh, improperly there was rampant misunderstanding of key christian doctrines the uh, apostle paul wrote his first letter to the corinthians in an attempt to restore the corinthian church to its foundation that foundation being jesus christ The church was plagued by divisions. The believers in uh, Corinth were the dividing into to groups. I'm of Paul, I'm of Paul, Apollos, and so on. They were loyal to certain spiritual leaders. Paul exhorted the uh, Corinthian believers to uh, be united because of uh, their devotion to Christ. Many in the church were essentially approving of an immoral relationship. Uh, things that we would just, you know, be hesitant to, hesitant to even talk about. Paul commanded them to expel the wicked man from the church. The Corinthian believers were... They was taking each other to court. And... So that we saw instructions on how that it would be better to be taken advantage, just outright be taken advantage of than to, to damage their Christian testimony. Paul gave, uh, in the first epistle we saw, Paul gave the Corinthian church uh, instructions on marriage, uh, on celibacy, uh, food sacrifice to idols, uh, Christian freedom, uh, the bailing of women, uh, the Lord's Supper, spiritual gifts, uh, and the resurrection, the gospel. Uh, the gospel is definitely seen in that in that epistle. Uh, So basically, the Holy Spirit, through Paul, he's, he's the author, not Paul. He was responding to all that conduct, that impro imp improper conduct, all the beliefs that they had accepted, the false beliefs and stuff. And yet, despite all of the rebukes and all of the corrections, the epistle brings our focus back to where it ought to be, and that's on Christ. And that's what the Holy Spirit did in the epistle to the first Corinthians. Uh, a proper understanding of the resurrection of Christ, uh, a proper understanding of our own resurrection. And I believe that that's the cure for what divides and defeats Christians. Uh, all blessings of grace being in Him and from Him uh, so that whoever glories should glory in Him so we finished 1 Corinthians, and so we begin a study of 2 Corinthians. I thought that we'd just uh, plow ahead in, in 2 Corinthians, since it has something to do with 1 Corinthians. There were... There wasn't very many years difference in time between the writing of 1 Corinthians and the writing of 2 Corinthians. Not much time, and yet there is a, a clear and distinct difference between the two letters. You know, like something has changed. Something's changed among the believers in Corinth. You can't read it without noticing that. 
Uh, and these were those who were said to be acting carnally in 1 Corinthians, and yet despite that, God lavishes them with grace chapter after chapter after chapter, and then we come to 2 Corinthians. I am sure that there are those much more qualified than I am who could actually spend hours discussing with you some of the the technical problems of first and second Corinthians, the uh, particularly of second Corinthians. Uh, there's a, a great number of theories on on why that is. That there are uh, there there were there are many that don't believe that Paul wrote much of it. Some don't even believe that he wrote any of it. And I, for one, believe that. Dearly beloved, uh, that the Holy Spirit wrote them both. So, that, so there's lots of arguments among Christians, among uh, particularly in the educational institutions and Bible scholars over all of the problems uh, relating it to First Corinthians. And folks, I can't find any reason at all why First Corinthians and Second Corinthians shouldn't be shouldn't both both of them be a composite picture of any group of believers who meet anywhere, who meet somewhere, meet anywhere, at any time, in any place. And so I see in 2 Corinthians a church that conformed to the Word of God given them in 1 Corinthians. And right away I'm thinking, old man, New man. I uh, I thought I'd amuse you by uh, by doing this. This uh, I'll uh, try to put a picture on the screen of this. I, I really want to spend some time here in this introductory to Second Corinthians, in uh, talking about us having come out of First Corinthians into Second Corinthians, uh, and how the. the what I clearly see is, uh, what I can't help but see is old man, new man. And we spent a lot of time talking about that. I don't see why that the two epistles can't both be a composite picture of any group of believers who meet anywhere. You know, don't say, well, my church isn't carnal and that church is carnal. I think that's, that's not what we're seeing. I see in 2 Corinthians a church that conformed to the Word of God given them in 1 Corinthians. And that makes me think old man, new man. Carnal, fleshly, new man, spiritual, new man. Uh, I cannot convince myself that the problems at Corinth were unique. Whereas, you know, I, you know, I look at the Ephesians and I say, well, you know, now there's a super group of Christians. But when I get to the book of Revelation, then I, I, I see that the Lord Jesus Christ had somewhat against the believers at Ephesus. You know, where they left their first love. God the Father begins addressing naughty children but he doesn't do it the way that we might have, you know, really tearing into them, beating them up, you know, because he began it in grace and our God operates in grace and he reminds us that we are his children, recipients of his love, the children of his calling, complete and entire in his giving of gifts, safe and secure in the family of, of the Father. And, and then he begins to look at those areas where these believers are living contrary to his will, contrary to his heart, contrary to his love. Uh, not a heart uh, or, or a, a, a love like mine, okay, but God's love. Uh, I can't compare God's heart to mine. God is not a man. Uh, 
God contends with the Israelites in saying that, that one of my great causes against Israel is that you have made God altogether one such as yourselves. And I, don't, I do not believe that that shortcoming is unique to the Israelites, but, but Christians. In many ways, we are, are constantly reducing God to some level of our own understanding. We're making Him out to be something that we think that He is that He's not. We're making God one who is able to uh, forget, you know, who's able to change, you know, ignore, and, and, and so on and so forth. The only safe revelation that I have of God is in this book. I find Him a sovereign God, I find he, a powerful God, a jealous God, a righteous God, a holy God. And I find that as the light of the Word of God shines on my heart, it's, it's, it's desperately different than the heart of God that I see revealed in the Scriptures. The first thing that we see in 1 Corinthians is that it is addressed to all who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing that strikes me as I come to 2 Corinthians is, is that the, the address, the dialogue is more localized and, and, and so I have to reach the conclusion that the message of 1 Corinthians is a fitting message for all groups. Is that not true of 2 Corinthians as well? Okay. Think old man, new man. But, you know, I, I'm getting way ahead of myself here. We know that both epistles were addressed to us today. You know, you can say, well, Steve, my church, well, my church doesn't respond as the group did at Corinth. And I believe the Holy Spirit's message primarily in 2 Corinthians is the revelation of a proper response to the Word of God. Uh, there are many uh, groups of believers who, who don't exhibit a proper response to the Word of God. And I get the, the first impression from the Holy Spirit that the group at Corinth, to a great extent, and did. It wasn't all bad. Uh, a group of uh, self-satisfied believers at Corinth, a group that was wealthy enough to be exhorted by the Apostle Paul to give of their wealth to the needy believers in Jerusalem. New man. And, and, and so in between Acts and 1 Corinthians, we get some kind of an indication that they gave enough that Paul was willing to accompany that offering it, into Jerusalem. So I'm certain that we can't level the charge of poverty against the believers at Corinth. And I understand there's different motives for giving, but obviously from the first epistle they're not greatly convicted about fornication and the fellowship and and insisting on one's rights even though it might trample on the toes of someone else it is a classic testimony in my opinion to the new creation how can god talk about us in both negative and positive, positively in the same breath, okay? But the Scriptures declare to me that in, in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Now, how did I get that new creation? Well, God gave it to me. And that's wonderful. That's what I want you folks to see. Surely, 2 Corinthians is a testimony to that new nature. To me, it's, 
It's the only thing that explains how God can call out a group of believers for being carnal just to turn right around and give me this a grand bubbling Niagara Falls of testimony to the greatness of His grace and the triumph of His love toward me and, and, and telling me that He always causes us to triumph and that we are a sweet-smelling fragrance to God. But we also act carnal, fleshly. We're self-reliant, self-righteous. If, if I go to the seventh chapter, chapter 7, verse 5, For when we were uh, come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, and within were fears uh, that, our, that our flesh had no rest. It's interesting to me that I don't find in the Scriptures where that the new nature is ever out of rest. Verse 6, Nevertheless, God that comforts those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. That was a wonderful work of the Word of God among the believers at Corinth. I think that's a sobering thought. That it meant more to Paul that those who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, the kind of people that you would sneer at look down on, you know, like, like the, listen to rap music, you know, or some, pick one, I, you know, anything. I, I don't like rap, so I shouldn't have mentioned that one, but, but I've had, I've ha folks, I've had an earful, okay, of all those things that Christians ought to not do. We have an old man. And it, it would be an easy thing to look down on our, our, our brother or our sister for something or another, especially something that we're not doing. You know, I think that must have been a tremendous temptation for Paul. You know, as much understanding as he had in the Word of God to look at the terrible spiritual ignorance and foolishness that existed at Corinth, what made the difference? Well, it seems to me the Holy Spirit is highlighting the fact that Paul recognized that, that any understanding that he had in the Word was a gift from God, not a result of his own intelligence, his own talents. Therefore, he was not above another brother in Christ. Not one bit above another brother. And yet he is, he is comforted because a group of believers at Corinth were touched by the Word of God and they changed their manner of life. And truth does that. And I guess I wonder deep in my own heart how much my manner of life or yours is really influenced by the truth of the Word of God and His love for us. I think 2 Corinthians shows us what happens in a body of believers where they function out of the new nature. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, that's how the epistle begins, and Timothy our brother, unto the church of God which is at Corinth with all the saints which are in all Achaia. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. The revelation is clear. Anyone who picks up this epistle knows the background. How did Paul become an apostle of Jesus Christ? 
Well, because God knocked him down on the road to Damascus. He wasn't certainly looking for Jesus. And revealed himself to him and told him, I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. That's how he's an apostle. Not because he decided to do it. To become that. You know, in the third grade and, and he trained for it. And, and then he couldn't hardly wait or whatever, you know, until he got old enough to become an apostle. Come on, folks. God intervened in his life, and he's an apostle by the will of God. And the believers at Corinth needed to know. They need to know. I need to know. You need to know that you are what you are because God put you there. Okay? Okay? I don't know what God's teaching you. But am I to sit back and criticize you when I don't know what God is doing in your life? You are acting fleshly, and at some point God intervened in your life. Your life may look like a disaster to me. And maybe to you. I don't know. But I know that my God is faithful, and I praise God that I can rest in an expression like, by means of the will of God. Folks, that is not a, some excuse for laziness. You know, which is pretty much what, the, you know, the old man. I don't find my life with my Heavenly Father a whole lot different in some respects than with my earthly father. You know, except, well, you know, my earthly father never, uh, or my heavenly father never makes any mistakes. And he always operates in love and grace. There were times when I was, I was certain that my earthly father was not operating in love. But there are other times as I look back on them, I know that He was. But my Heavenly Father always operates in love. I believe Paul rested in the will of God. That pushed him a long ways on his, on his journey, folks. We're in chapter 1, verse 1. The Lord willing will continue every Sunday. Catch us on Wednesdays. We'll be looking at... Uh, Jesus' parables. I love you all. I truly do. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we are thankful for Thy Word, for the privilege and the opportunity that we have to study it together. We long to grow in grace and knowledge of You. May the Lord Jesus Christ be glorified. For it's in His name we pray. Amen.